the transition of digital was a, a bit, kind of an easy step, but there are so many excellent photographers, and you just happen to be at the right place at the right time. But my wife and I were uh, gifted or blessed with a trip through Songstan Hotels last year. Never been to China. My wife is Chinese, Singaporean, Indonesian. So, you know, kind of the enigma. Who had, has, has anybody else been to Yunnan besides these three? Just a couple of right. Yeah, anybody interested in Yunnan or know anything about it? it? Kind of a general summary, I love British Columbia and Southeast Alaska, my home state's Washington State, state of confusion at this point, but we love the mountains. And Yunnan is the closest thing I've seen to the Fraser Canyon, the BC Coastal Range, Southeast Alaska, and yet fill it with more animal diversity, greater number of azaleas and rhododendrons than I can imagine. Flowers. we we put in our gardens that are wild, they're like primulas, um, or poppies. Uh, there's one plant called the rhubarb. It's in the rhubarb family, but it's like a big cone and it creates its own hothouse at four and a half thousand meters. It's amazing and it incubates its seeds. And bird diversity, I've never seen so many thrushes. So as a caveat, uh, there's a group of Chinese photographers who have contributed some camera trap pictures to see a wild musk deer is so rare, so difficult to see a wild cereal. You see birds, I mean, I see things canopy. Some of the birds you stumble on, like mono or pheasants. But the rest of them, uh, I want to give credit to some Singaporean photographers that are here, and uh, some through um, Flickr, and uh, again, these Chinese, and also a group called Mammal Watch. And they do trips specifically to go find an uh, animal I'm going to question you later and see if you know what it is. So without much anything, Yunnan, uh, its name came from, now you're going to have to help me with the dynasty, about 600 AD time? Is that, is that right? They um, discovered tea, and some of you, I don't know, I might have to sit down, I can't make this thing work, so <laughs> excuse me, it better heard than seen. Is it possible to switch off the lights in the video? Oh, there we go. Okay. And so it's called the Southern Land of the Clouds, which is an amazing area. Um, I had the privilege of my first trip to Nepal in 2015, and we tried to do the eastern section of the Great Himalayan Trail from Kachanchunga across Lumbasuma Pass down into Makalu. And uh, we were not only hit with rotten weather, but in April we were hit with a magnitude seven and a half earthquake. And so we actually dodged some rocks the size of a Volkswagen. Um, it didn't hit particularly hard in where we were, but in a rock area we were, but in the, in the Pokering and the Everest Base Camp and some of the areas closer to the epicenter, it was really major. So this is on the eastern edge. This is Quakagapo on the right, which is 6,700 meters. And this is from our hotel room. <laughs> I'm used to for spending four or five weeks. Sorry? Way, way. Uh, I'll explain. This is in Meli. This is in Yunnan. This is part of the Song Song Hotels. But the, um, the the color carry is pretty bad. Is it, it seems washed out. Is that just a projector or? It's a projector. Yeah. You it's see the special. difference? Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Uh, well, that's okay. Projector. Anyway, it rained on us two days in October and um, finally cleared, but to give you a little idea of the beauty of this area, uh, whoops, I have to go backwards, Jade Snow Mountain, it's a, it's a valley, valleys and peaks over uh, tremendous, this is supposed to be the deepest gorge um, in Yunnan, not in Tibet, I think it's twice the depth of the Grand Canyon, this is Jade Mountain and then the Yangtze or the Changchanqian River goes through it. Tiger Deeping Gorge, I'm sure you've heard of it. And uh, one of the first bends in the Yangtze River. Uh, it was amazing. We were picked up with a white BMW X3. I can't even afford one, let alone ride in one. So this was really, really a first class treat. And some of the rivers that you cross, uh, the Mekong, the Noom, which come, becomes the Salwan, and this is the Noom that runs uh, parallel to uh, Burma and then actually becomes the Salwan. 
so it's an amazing area from uh, a botanical rich area from subtropical forest to alpine in Kaoyonggong Shan uh, near the Burma border to uh, the upper Dutchin and upper Yunnan the Baima Snow Mountain which is a reserve there's still barrel sheep they claim that there's snow leopard and this is uh, Minjiao Lakes one of the most beautiful places we've ever seen, a series of lakes with waterfalls. We were, this is in the fall, but we were absolutely stunned with the beauty and the diversity of Yuna. And we were in the fall, uh, I would love to see it in the spring. 25 ethnic cultural groups here, from Lisu to Noxi to Tibet, and all kinds of Bai. Uh, it's amazing. The Lisu are a bit of a problem to me in the national parks we have in, in the states or North America no, nobody can live in the park and nobody can hunt in the park and here you've got the Lisu were once crossbow hunters and have taken out almost all the game um, there's no there's very few bear left Himalayan bear there's very few musk deer very few of the white nosed deer there's a sandbar that's gone um, leopard is a pretty much gone, so things are pretty rare these days. This is Ta Cheng, which is the beginning of the route that we took, right during the rice harvest. And we got the privilege of seeing, it was orchestrated by the Chinese government, a harvest festival, but we're the only whites there. My wife was, actually, I'm the only white there, my wife is Asian. And so uh, we got to see some of the traditional music. Here he's playing a Iruwu, and notice he has a leopard skin apron. That's from his grandfather. So this was once a very wild area. Uh, the Tibetan fox, their shirts on the right, the Lisu is made with hemp, the lady in the center, uh, with the Amherst pheasant, the beautiful pheasant with the long, long, bright tails. You don't see many of them. They're really hard to find unless you go to Bhutan. But then the lady in the, in the center is um, Tibetan in her dress. They have a special drum and a ragu dance that they do that is uh, a bit, it's more of a form of animism than Buddhism. And the crescents represent the, the moon. Um, they wear a cape of sheepskin. Well, the Nazi wear a cape of sheepskin that represents the universe and the stars. It's fascinating their culture. And we had a chance to see a rare uh, mass festival in Sitsong in the monastery. I'm not Buddhist, but it was really interesting to see they're literally trying to scare the hell out of the Tibetan villagers. So they're good, do, do well for their karma, and the faces that they see uh, are supposed to scare them. In fact, there was one point where a guy comes out, a monk, deer mask, and he has a pink heart. And he cuts the heart out. It was really, uh, really interesting. So the forests are also amazing. Um, in our eastern United States, that I'm from, I'm from the west coast, but in the eastern United States, you've got oaks and walnuts and hickory and maples. That's what's here. Plus, you have hemlock, fir, pine, spruce. Um, we've got one species of rhododendron and one species of azalea in the Cascades. Back east, there's a couple of species of rhododendron, maybe three azaleas. Here, you've got 40 species of rhododendron small area. I, I don't know what the count is on Azaleas. The botanical diversity is just beyond my comprehension. And so these are cheat shots. They're from Nepal. But this is what you'd see. Um, I wish I could remember some of the names. The blue poppy, of course, the different species of rhododendrons. And barbets, sunbirds, tragophan, mono. Those are cheat shots. Those are from Nepal. Must deer. Uh, it is a wild panda. And uh, the goral on the left. Who can name that creature on the right? Now, that's through a camera trap, through one of the photographers I know in China, out of Do you know what that creature is? Right inside, lower right. Lower right. The must deer has tusks. I'll ask you a little later. We'll come back to it. So, the three parallel rivers are amazing. It actually connects the Tibetan Plateau. The uh, Salween runs through this way. The Mekong, which is 
amazing river, and the longest river in China is the Yangtze, which ends up in Shanghai Bay. So the Yangtze is 6,400 meters or kilometers in, in length. The, uh, the Mekong is about 4,600 kilometers in length, and then you can see where the Salween is. What's interesting about the, the Mekong is that the Amazon is the longest river in the world, just barely longer than the Nile. But it has the greatest diversity of fish species in any freshwater area. The second in the world is the Mekong, which I didn't know. They're damming the snot out of it. The Chinese government is um, building dams to create hydroelectric power, and uh, it's a bit frightening to see if uh, fish migrations end up getting blocked, which is going to hurt the whole southern part of the Mekong Delta. So this is the topography. You can see up to the north is uh, glaciated, um, many, many high peaks. So we started an area at Lijiang. We crossed uh, the Mekong, crossed the mountains, got up, or across, sorry, the, the Yangtze, crossed a series of mountains, then into the Mekong went north to Dechen, and then at Cabo Cable, we crossed back over to the Mekong, then back to the Yangtze, came down. When you say cross, you, you, you cross drove a bridge, a piece. You, you, you drove we drove, sorry. Right, you drove. So this is a, I'll introduce this later, but my wife suggested I put that plug up front. So, sorry about that, Carrie. It's May 31st, and I'll explain. Um, it gives you kind of an idea of, of the rivers, but the plateau, the Tibetan Plateau is the largest plateau in the world. And towards the south, uh, what makes this area so biologically diverse is the monsoons run up north-south. So this mountain range is north-south. So the monsoonal influence and the subtropical rainforest influence of Burma and Thailand uh, push all the way up these three these three rivers in this particular area are gorgeous because the rains can pass. They're not blocked by the Himalayas. So you have a mix of Tibetan, uh, Chinese, Montane uh, forest mixed with subtropical. So it's a tremendous area for plant diversity. Butterflies like you, you can't believe. Um, bird diversity, I, I just am amazed. So you can see the length of the Mekong. Again, that's a river that really interests me. Well, we followed the T-Horse Trail. So going back to the Tang Dynasty in 640 or 680, it helped me because my Chinese history is terrible. I have enough trouble with US history. Um, they ended up discovering tea actually in, uh, it's called Pu'er, and there's a place called Pu'er, China. And it's a, it's a bit of a fermented tea. There's some of the teas, some of the trees are huge. And the, Best poor tea leaves are on the top of this tree, and guys climb and handpick. But it's a bit of an acquired taste for American. I didn't drink coffee till probably 50, 60, and I'm from Seattle, the home of Starbucks. And the only way I drink coffee is if I mix it with a whole big cup of creamer and maybe chocolate, then I can drink coffee. But poor is a kind of accumulated, uh, acquired taste. It's fermented. If it's fermented right, it has an ambrose flavor, and it's amazing in its, its taste. But I've had bad stuff when it's mixed with yak tea, and it's rancid, and it smells like fish in it. Oh, but these guys were amazing. So I met one of Song Sam's workers called Nunu. His father was a muleteer, 100, and he's 90 years old, so this would be 1930, 40s, somewhere in there, 30s, 20s. And he crossed numerous passes, carried tea, some carried them on their backs, up to, I better guess, I, I think and I'm thinking of 175 pounds. I'm not sure how to put that into kilos. And he ran the horses. So um, this was a, an amazing, scary trip. Joseph Roth wrote about this in the 1922s and 1940s. And uh, he wrote for National Geographic. And he's got amazing stories of how these guys fought off robbers and they had to cross I don't know how many countless passes often with snow these were tough guys I thought some of the Northwest Indians uh, the Haida and the Clinkets were tough I could tell you stories of how they toughened their children immersing them in cold water beating them with willow brushes so they could do the long canoe voyages south 
But these guys were amazing for what they could do and what they carried. They traded the tea, which became an acquired taste in Tibet, for a Mustangs, mm -hmm. or the, with the best Tibetan horse made, uh, that was, that was um, bred, of course, to fight off Mongols, to fight off any tribal warfare up to the north. This was pre-Chinese, uh, uh, the Great Wall. And so the tea was providing vitamins for a nutrient-poor southeastern Tibet that could barely grow any potatoes and barely grow barley. Uh, boy, tea was a welcome, was a welcome trade. So Baima Dorji is creating a series of lodges through Songshan, which we got to do the first half, which goes from Lichiang through north to Jiechen, through uh, Sitsang, Taqing, um, Meili, and will eventually go through Kham in Tibet and ends up in Lhasa. So you could take time in five-star lodges. We didn't go that far. But then you had John Hilton, the British writer who wrote about Shangri-La. Mm. And uh, they say this is the Shangri-La Yunnan, but everybody has their own Shangri-La. The actual city of Shangri-La is burnt down a few years ago. They recreated it. Li Qiang had a fire. They recreate that. But it's thought Li Qiang, or Shangri-La was more of a, a Buddhist meditation of thought. It was a place where people arrived. And what really said was a place was the, uh, oh boy, the Yarlung Sampo River that goes through Nancha Barwa, the seven and a half thousand meter peak on the eastern part of Tibet. It's in the wildest country in the world. And uh, it only first got ran about eight years ago. Many people have died trying to kayak it. Nobody's made it, except for a team finally last year. And then you had um, another writer, he was um, Peter Gouillard, who was a Russian linguist, and he spent time, his home is, have you seen that in his home in Lijian? A small home, and he wrote about the Nazi people. The Nazi were amazing in, um, when we saw some of the festivals, and I'll explain a little bit later. So the first part we're exploring is the Yangtze or Zhenqiang River. This is lowlands, about two and a half thousand meters, and uh, my wife loves nature. I'm used to roughing and climbing since a kid, so I didn't kick and scream when I got to stay in a five-star hotel. <laughs> And they sang us a Tibetan Nazi song, pardon me, when we came in, put the scarves on us, and really made you feel like you're part of family. It's, it's amazing how the Tibetan culture welcomes you. So that's uh, Nazi on the left. Normally they have braided hair, and these are artificial braids. And they're pairing the Urhu, or Urhu, the Tibetan two string fiddle. fiddle. And uh, some of the amazing dances. And this is the Tibetan culture. So the children, the old men, the, the culture, although the government orchestrated it for a film crew from um, Kunming, we were privileged to be able to just film and watch them practice. Again, we were so fortunate. So this might bore you. I'm going to skip through parts of it. They're preparing for their dress. Oh, no sound. Is there a reason? Um, oh, gosh, I wish you could hear the singing. That's the Urwu. Uh, I have no idea. My Sorry, this though. is typical Nazi, which is from the Tibetan style of their hands with the long silk sleeves. Uh, the wind. I don't know. Would the computer it's not be all right? Well, then you wouldn't see it. Yeah. No, I mean, let's, let's try that again. It's so rare to be able to see this. We were we're really really thankful. Okay, I, I won't. it will just be a quick clip. Then. <coughs> well, 
Well, anyway, I apologize about that. That's um, I'm technically challenged as 71, so I'm not sure how to. And it's so amazing how friendly the villagers were. They would take you, you'd walk along a trail, and there's chestnuts that are falling. Mm -hmm. And picking off the ground, and a, and a woman that was picking was saying, she said to us in Tibetan to our guide, saying, why don't you come to my home? I've just roasted a bunch of chestnuts, oh, and give them a try. Yeah. It's, it's so welcoming in the, in the whole community. You feel like you're part of the family. And I got to watch Harvest, which was... Uh, Really, really fun. Lots of peppers. My wife and I love, I love Mexican chili peppers. She loves the Asian peppers. She wins. She can take the hotter pepper than me. <laughs> then we visited the Lee Sioux Village. These are hunters. Um, quite an amazing group of people. They go back to crossbows. Uh, they do uh, backstrap weaving with wool. Uh, quite an amazing group of people and I went met one older man she says she's 85 on the right uh, again Rinchen speaks Tibetan as well as Chinese Mandarin as well as English that uh, he had some really interesting stories which I can't remember <laughs> then you have the Yelu which is a different cultural group and some of the different characters in the faces of Shangri-La it's quite a contrast of forest and um, architecture. So there, the Dalai Lama version, Dalai Lama, that's a fish, sorry. The Dalai Lama version of Buddhism, and I found it to be, and I, I want to be very respectful, but I found it to be um, very superstitious, and I learned later, that's what Joseph Rock wrote about, they mixed huge amount of animism. So uh, like the Northwest Indians, they believe the spirit is in everything. And uh, so there was a lot of fear involved in, in their traditions and the mass festival. And so I did some reading to try and understand more really interesting faces. So let's get to the natural history. Yayoshan National Park is this area. Um, noon. This is wild, and I'm going to do a trip with a guy in June.